with our next presenter, CJ Golding, who currently serves as a consultant and partner with the Avarna Group, a firm that creates pathways, provides resources and innovating strategies that support the outdoor and environmental sector in their evolution towards justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is also known as JEDI. This all grows out of the soul of professional experience in the fields of conservation and outdoor education, youth leadership development, and DEI with public land agencies, nonprofits, and for profit organizations. I will now turn it over to CJ Golding to give us a diversity, equity, and inclusion overview. CJ, the floor is yours. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, I am excited to be a part of this conversation with you all today. Um, my name is CJ Golding, as uh, Mia shared, and uh, I use uh, he and him pronouns. Uh, in the chat, I'm calling from uh, my home uh, in, uh, in Muncie Lenape lands, which is also known as Teenage New Jersey. And uh, I will be sharing a little bit about an over about ooh, don't, that's not what I wanted to do yet about uh, the roots of systemic change and about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I will uh, I'll be using uh, short anecdotes, metaphors, and a systems change framework uh, to be able to share a little bit about the work that I do, who I am, where I come from and give, hopefully give us a couple of calls to action uh, of, of, of what we can do to create that sort of change in the forest sector. So uh, here's a quick overview. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who I am, what's my story, why am I here? Uh, I will talk a little, bit, a little bit about the forest where we are planted. Uh, we'll touch on the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And then we'll close uh, with an overview of systems change and your role, what you can do uh, to create change in the role or organization that you are in. So uh, Mia read my, my bio, um, and oftentimes I uh, shy away from listing uh, uh, everything that you can find on my LinkedIn and my bio because it, I find that people don't even, don't necessarily remember that, but I do like to describe myself in terms of how I show up. So um, as a person, uh, I'm passionate about community and leadership. I'm passionate about growth and learning. I'm creative, a writer and photographer. I'm an advocate for equity and justice in every space that I enter into. I'm a lover of stories and the people that tell them and I am a learner and a facilitator. I'm uh, zooming in uh, from uh, my house, which is uh, right next to my, uh, my, my late grandmother's house. And I, anytime I enter into a space, I like to acknowledge where I am from and so, uh, here you see the people who have uh, invested in me and who have spent, uh, whose characteristics, whose knowledge, whose uh, life experience I bring into uh, these spaces who help make me who I am and determine how I show up um, in these spaces with you and with the communities that I work with. And so you have my brother on the left, my mother, my father, um, who I get my uh, goofiness and then also my, uh, my stoicism from. And then uh, my mother and my grandfather mother who uh, are at the root of my love and connection to nature and why I, uh, why I know that this, this idea of connected to nature, this idea of um, being, um, a, creating change in these outdoor spaces is not uh, something that started with me, but it started before me and that I am carrying forward. This is a quick overview. This is, these are some of the, I'm, I, I may not have roots or experience in the forest sector specifically, but um, as, as we read in the bio there, uh, I do have experience and uh, connection in conservation, public land management, um, outdoor recreation and things of that nature. So uh, the outdoors is not, uh, is not new to me. This idea of uh, trying to increase diversity, equity and inclusion in public land agencies in outdoor spaces is something that uh, is, has been a, uh, a process that I've been going on as my career has developed. 
some highlights from that include uh, the beginning. Uh, so leading outdoor trips, outdoor uh, canoeing and uh, backpacking trips for high schoolers in Washington State in the North Cascades. Um, the opportunity to take uh, young adults to the to public lands and introduce them to public lands, such as uh, Yosemite National Park and some of the experiences that go along with that. The opportunity to build culture, uh, not to, to exchange culture and build community um, with young adults. And so understanding and building relationships and, and putting down roots in different cultures so that uh, to help understand and build bridges between folks as they show up to these spaces. Uh, this photo, and I think maybe the next photo are, are examples of Alaskan natives learning about Kwanzaa and other cultures from uh, young adults who are from the Compton and Los Angeles areas. Uh, part of my job is in, a part of my job or experience has been in training young leaders and in youth leadership development. Um, in uh, building their community organizing skills, uh, building their civic action, building their leadership potential, oh, supporting their leadership potential, and uh, things along the, that line and, and that, uh, in that nature. So similar to what uh, was shared in the, in the previous speech, uh, the importance of mentors, I've both been a beneficiary of uh, mentor-mentee relationships and strive to pass that forward. Uh, as well um, in everything that I do. Uh, and in speaking about this, uh, this in speaking about diversity and inclusion in uh, specifically in outdoor recreation, um, this is an essay, uh, Why We're Joining to the Great Outdoors is an essay that I wrote a few years back that uh, talks a little bit more about uh, the perspective. Uh, uh, I, I know I'm following in the footsteps of uh, folks who have gone before me, but then what my perspective is in, in doing that and my excitement for creating change and increasing diversity and equity in uh, the spaces that we live and work in. So to get us started today, I, I, I wanna talk about, uh, the. I'm gonna dive into the forest uh, that we've been planted in. I think Oftentimes when we look at systems, when we look at the, the world that we've been, uh, we were, have been born into or the, the, the work experiences and the organizations that we've stepped into, our society, our communities, these are things that have existed long before us. They have structures, they have patterns, they have uh, laws, rules, policies that existed, uh, ideology that existed long before we came into the picture. And we often, if we go along with the flow, we may not see that. For instance, here we have, uh, this is a picture of, of a bike with a bell. And, but the, and the point of this is to show that some of these laws and structures that have existed before we came onto the picture don't fit how we see the world or how we interact with the world today. Since 1869, New Jersey has had uh, a law on its books that required all bicycles to be equipped with bells capable of giving a signal audible for a distance of least, at least 100 feet. The rule, the law was implemented in 1869. And of course, if you're talking about 1869, like then it was probably applicable, it was probably relevant, it probably made sense, but it still remains on the book. And it, and it relates, it goes back to animosity between cyclists and pedestrians. So even despite recommendations that this law be struck, it has not been changed. And unfortunately can still be used uh, for, for, uh, to enforce um, improper searches or to enforce prejudice and uh, bias or even as an excuse to stop black cyclists. In one case in 2018, uh, police in New Jersey used it as an excuse to stop a bicyclist who they claimed was acting suspiciously and then increase the charges that uh, were being uh, held against him. And similarly, in the forest sector, we want to understand the the our not only our approaches to managing uh, natural the, our natural environment or not managing our relationship with these environments, but we want to understand our uh, our structures, our organizations, our hiring practices, all of these things that have existed long before we came into the picture, and but may not be as applicable or as relevant to the world we live in now and the communities and people who we are trying to reach. When we talk about forestry strictly from a practical perspective, many of the plans that govern the management of our forests and grasslands are, 
they themselves can be based on outdated 20th century science and worldview. So just like we have to update those in the way we deal with our forest and our green spaces, we also have to update the way we deal with and approach the people we are working with. Updating our worldview, revamping these systems that are necessary and shifting our approach. It benefits local communities who are visiting these areas at an increased rate. It provides a balance between recreation and conservation to ensure that these spaces can support human visitors and healthy wildlife habitat. And it equips us and our environment to collaborate as we adapt to climate change. So in the increase in wildfires and flooding and things of that nature. The uh, acronym DEIJ uh, talks about uh, inclusion, but, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but our goal is to be expansive, is to grow to innovate and to adapt in order to equitably support the human and more than human communities that we are a part of. One more quote on, on uh, systems and that have existed before th that we may be unaware of. It says fish does not discover water. In fact, because they're completely immersed in it, they live unaware of its existence. Similarly, when a conduct is normalized by a dominant cultural environment, it becomes invisible. And so in this case, I asked the question and I want to propose to us uh, some of the learning that I want to share with us in the framework I want to share with us today uh, to, to improve or to, as we progress on our DEIJ journey is our tips on how to become more aware or tips on how to become more aware of the, the structures that we live in so that we can become fish who are aware of the water around us and figure out what we want to do in order to change it. Some of the big equity questions uh, to ask uh, as, we, as we increase in this awareness are who shaped the contours of the forest sector and conservation movements? Who was at the helm? Who helped get things rolling at the, at the start of this, the structure we currently live and work in? What were some of the driving ideologies and values of those who founded our current system of conservation and forestry? Whose ideas, whose connections to place and well being were centered? And whose were ignored, sacrificed, or sought to be extinguished in that process. Thinking about all of that, we, we, that's, that's history, and we use history to increase our awareness of how that might be uh, applying or happening in the present. And so how does work in the forestry, get, in forestry sector get carried out? How does the story of growth in these forests get told? Um, so... As I said before, expansion, I, I like to, when we talk about inclusion, I mean, we talk about the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Uh, centering equity and justice in our journey updates our humanity toolkit. It makes, it helps us, it, it's an update on our phone, basically. It helps us to be better fit for the present and the future. It increases our awareness of systems of oppression, how they show up in our daily lives and what we can do to dismantle those systems and to build anew. Folks talk about inclusion and oftentimes uh, I, I struggle using the word inclusion because inclusion is inviting folks to the table. It's, it's closer to assimilation. And this is mentioned in the toolkit uh, as well that, uh, that was, is shared or will be shared with you all. It's bringing people into an established system that has an inequitable foundation that is not made with them in mind. Whereas expansion is a focus on internal growth. It's us as a sector, us as an organization, us as individuals, shifting to accommodate and adapt to changing audiences and new environments. If we are continue to try and bring people into a table, for instance, with that law in New Jersey that's developed in 1869, if we continue to try and build people, bring people into something that was established in 1869, it may not fit 2021. So we're working on growing as a sector, as, a, as, as individuals, as organizations, so that we can be leaders and a part of how society is changing and shifting. And I think as we talk about recruitment and retention and, and things of that nature, that becomes critical and becomes key. People can recognize when you update your phone. People, like we're walk, folks are walking around, if, if you saw someone with a beeper, you would recognize that they may not have updated their technology, te technology toolkit to, to be in 2021. Not saying beepers are bad, but just it's a signal that folks have not updated but when you see someone with a smartphone when you see someone with you know their bluetooth headphones whatever whatever it shows that they are adapting and changing and expanding to accommodate and meet up with the time and the current uh and current events 
So let's dive into systems change. Uh, I will share my slides with you afterwards. So if I blow through this slide, particularly uh, this particular slide quickly, um, it's not because I don't want you to read what's on here. Um, it's because I will talk about these things later and we'll share this with you so that you can look at it as well. But uh, in, in learning and working with uh, an organization uh, called FSG and, and an organization called Social Innovation Generation, they've developed a framework uh, for uh, conditions of systems change. So how to become aware of of the systems that you live, well, becoming aware of the systems that you live in, the water that you're swimming in, and then some understanding some of the levers that you can pull on and push on in order to create change, not just on a surface level, but deep on a systems level that actually is sustainable and will continue. So, and here is the, di here is the quick diagram. I'll spend a couple of minutes here before uh, I uh, get, uh, before I finish, wrap up with our call to action um, and uh, wrap up my time here. But these six conditions of systems change, first of all, happen on three levels. They happen on a structural level, which is very explicit and things that you can see. Things that are very, that are easily, these are the surface level. So the diagram of roots on the bottom shows what is deeper, uh, in the background shows what is deeper and what, uh, what is at the surface. So structural change, policies, practices, resource flows happen on the surface. Changing a policy at your organization, changing, you know, incorporating a new, trying to incorporate a new tradition, uh, giving money to organizations or communities that may have been, mar that are marginalized or have been oppressed in the past. These are, these are on the surface. And oftentimes this is where people start because this is the easy, these are the easiest levers to pull. These are the most obvious, these are, in all frankness, these are what organizations and people can do to get the credit for advancing on the DEI journey without getting all the way to the roots. So these are not bad in and of themselves, but this is not the end. Once we go a little bit deeper, we understand that policies, practices, and resource flows are based on relationships and connections. They're based on power dynamics. This relational change is a little bit harder to recognize and understand. But these are also areas where you can shift or understand where there might be inequity and imbalance and shift it so that we are creating cultures and communities and workplaces that welcome or welcome or attract folks who want to continue to update and live in a world um, that is that is applicable or that is welcoming and expansive and includes includes everyone. And at the core of it, the hardest to change, the most transformative change and the most implicit change are our mental models. The idea of manifest destiny, the idea that, uh, the, the idea that land is, is ours to be taken, uh, which, which was at the root of expansion in our country and the oppression of our indigenous brothers and sisters is a mental model that continues to show up today in different relationships and connections and power dynamics and policies and practices. Even with the seizure of land by cities um, in, 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 in today's day and age. But that is at the core, the mental models that we have, the biases we might hold, the ideology, ideologies of one group of people being better than another. Those are some of the core mental models that we want to shift and make sure that our systems and organizations are not per perpetuating uh, that will keep people away or turn people away once they've come inside. For those of you who learn differently, I just put the same information in a different format. So when you get the slides, you can decide which one works best for you, but this is the same information that I just talked through in a, in a different format. And so the big question, how do we change those systems? Like, what do we do in order to create that change? First, uh, we, we build up our awareness. We apply it to present day. We build up our awareness using history. So we reflect on the history of how the forest sector has been developing and moving over the past, uh, over, its, over the course of it, its existence. Look at how it is being applied to the present. What makes, how, how are those systems currently upholding inequity? How, are our, how is our culture uh, keeping folks away? I, I think we talk about the idea of recruitment but if your culture is uh, appealing, folks will be clamoring to be involved. If folks are not clamoring to be involved, 
it's either a, a matter of low awareness or there's something happening at the core in the culture that might be pushing folks away. And so how do we change what's currently happening? And then how do we adapt and apply and grow for the future? And so one first step is to assess the current, current mindset or system, look at the past, assess the past, assess the current mindset or system, address that imbalance and equality, and then imagine and create something new. And I'm not saying we should recreate the wheel here. I'm not, a, I, I'm a proponent of using what works and relying on the wisdom of those who have an experience of those who have gone before and our ancestors. Uh, but understanding that if we have lived in this box or worked in this box for a long period of time, it's going to take some radical imagination for us to step outside of it. And for final, the, my final, the final, my final takeaways here uh, and summation of, of, of uh, my time with you or what I've intended to share is one, we have to understand where our roots are planted. Understand the forest that we've, like, that we've been planted in, the water that we swim in as fish. Set intentions for our growth and our expansion. Uh, we want to understand our role and level in shifting systems. And so if we look back at those six factors for systems change, if I am a manager and I have power, I have power or influence over hiring, that's the area where I can enact change. If I'm someone who is working directly with the community, that's the area where I can, where I can have impact and enact change. If I you know, am, am an executive in an organization, like understand your role and the, the levers that you can pull from your role in creating change and shifting systems. Be imaginative and expansive in creating the new. So uh, think about the world that we would like to live in and then think about the steps that you can take from your role to move towards that direction. And then last but not least, understand that everything is planted in relationship and learning. So as we talk about, as we go into the rest of this uh, symposium and talk about things like recruitment and retention, as we talk about you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, as we talk about connecting with different communities and engaging with different communities, understand that that moves at the speed of relationship. And so all of these things are built in the relationships we can, we can establish with the individuals we work with as mentors and mentees, uh, the communities that we, uh, that, the, our, that we are connected with and hope to build the stronger connections with, um, and the folks who are working in our organization that we hope to retain and to keep. There's no way that retention happens without a relationship with the people who you are working with and understanding and hearing from them what makes this culture worth staying in and what might make folks want to leave and step out. So understand that everything is planted in relationship and learning and communication along those lines. And so that's my final call to action is to find your role and influence, to collaborate with others, to build relationships and to follow the lead and wisdom of communities who have been marginalized and keep pushing forward even when progress seems slow and small. Thank you, CJ, for setting the stage with the JEDI overview. It is important to have a vision and a foundation to build from. So thank you for setting us up for success.